I'll just emphasize the theme. So this next theme is urine processing and liquid fertilizers, and but I do notice there's a few other things in there as well again. So it is a little bit broader. So I'd just like to start with our first presentation, which is on the nice loop. Um, and I'd like to invite Sean from UTS and Lee to start this presentation. So I just invite them to come up at the present moment. And I should just introduce myself which is, I'm Jason Pryor, I'm with the Institute for Sustainable Futures. I'm working with four other people from ISF on the NICE project, which is Dana, um, Kerry, and Jordan, who will be introduced and will present later today. Our particular focus at the Institute is on the socio-technical, which is um, a large part and a large determinant of these processes. But now, today, I'd just like to invite Sean and Lee to come up um, to start the presentation. Thank you. The Zing was, you can come here and then we can have a presentation together. <laughs> So we will briefly summarize the, what's the progress of the NICE loop, which is the Melbourne loop. So we have a collaborate with the, our original water, was uh, Southeast water. So trying to make a more scale up of the NICE loop development. So NICE loop is a, a mobile futuristic <coughs> public toilet for public exhibition in the CBD. The mobile toilet fit with the source separation unit and treatment as site. The application of treated urine for urban farming and vertical garden. So we try to utilize this living lab for exhibition for full nutrient concept in a circular economic concept. So we also have a collaboration between Southeast Water, UTS, UOM, as well as the, our origin water. So this is the objective of the, this project public education and advocacy on supply economy of nutrient. So a number of people are expected to use this uh, mobile public toilet. Also educational, social, and technical, environmental, economic, political features. The technology exhibition of the urine separation toilet. Also application of treated urine for urban farming and vertical garden. Also we have a uh, uh, some of the open design competition for this nice loop. So try to make a uh, next generation of the, uh, our public toilet system because it has not been updated for the last 100 years of the public toilet. So long-term operation, monitoring, data collection for the, this line, nice loop <coughs> for public exhibition. So this is the, our first uh, technical uh, slide for the overview and preliminary design of the, our caravan system. So we will share about the, our progress. Yeah, so basically, uh, as uh, Sean mentioned, uh, we have, uh, uh, I suppose, pretty much uh, complete the, the design. This, uh, this is we uh, retrofit from the, uh, from the uh, traditional trailer. And uh, on the right hand and the left hand side, we will have a male and female toilets. For the female toilets, we will have a urine diversion toilet. And for the male one, we have uh, one urinal, one urine diversion toilet. In the middle, we will uh, install our uh, urine treatment system and to convert the urine to the, uh, to the liquid fertilizers. So we. Uh, yeah, we completely uh, we complete the design already, and now it's uh, for the next stage of the building and construction. So, for further details, you can see that we want to combine some of the solar uh, panel to have a uh, just this uh, energy free the caravan system. Also, try to connect inside all the uh, very fancy IT and then some of data collection system, also educational video, so when you urinate, you can see the video, how we are collecting, how we are <laughs> converting, so you can see the, how educated during your something very urgent, 
And then also we have a, a lot of uh, fancy uh, greenwash system next to the our caravan. So you can have uh, your own fertilizer and then convert directly and then you can have a vertical, vertical garden near the toilet. So make a very fancy toilet system. That's the, what we are planning to design. <coughs> So based on the, in the middle of section, you can see that this is the uh, female toilet, two pedestal toilet. So this is the main toilet. One is the, just the waterless uh, urinal, also pedestal toilet. So in the, this is the different little bit. And then in between, so we collect <laughs> urine and then have uh, our initial tank for the hydrolyzed urine. And then we have designed to uh, MBI system to convert our urine to fertilizer and then we can have a uh, tanks it can be an uh, outside uh, located uh, tank system and then directly we can apply to the, the parklands or gardening so that's the, what we have designed so next slide is the origin water we have uh, uh, collaborated together to design this uh, membrane bioreactor system and then she will share the, what we have uh, progressed so far Okay. Uh, here is a, a design for the uh, mini baby MBR system. Actually, uh, our uh, no, normally our unit MBR unit is about like um, thousand kilometers per day, but this one is uh, like fifteen kilometers per day. So it's very small, but we have all the functions and uh, everything uh, controlled by the panel. So this is. Uh, really powerful small unit. So um, I hope from that system we can work in, uh, we, we can work very well for our urine recovery, uh, recovery process. And we will learn more about like how to modify that uh, small system for further uh, applications. Thank you. Thank you. So we have an ultra filtration membrane from origin water. So we can remove all the viruses, also some of the pathogen as well as uh, we can also have a very uh, simple uh, optimized uh, membrane barrier system monitored by the all the uh, remote controlling system so that's the what we have designed so this is uh, available upstairs in our building so after your dinner just light dinner it's not very uh, formal dinner so light dinner and then we can show you upstairs for our unit of the membrane barrier system which will be located in our caravan also downstairs we will share the, our urine collection system so if you are interested uh, you can just uh, wait until end of the day and then we can just uh, show you around in this uh, system and this is the what we are planning to do so we can put the, all the fancy thing like the IT connection of the toilet so you can see what's the our intention of the, this design of the caravan and how we can make it sure our satellite economy system and then this is the uh, solar panel and this is the our uh, green wall we can allocate to, them <coughs> to make a more user-friendly public toy system which could be the next generation of the public toilet for a satellite economy system also we plan to have a uh, this uh, uh, urine diverting toilet for the pedestal type also male urinal you can easily just uh, collect uh, your urine so we want to try also this uh, pedestal urine system challenge will be um, watermarks exemption and approvals also plumbing exemption procurement exemption also we have to make sure the DDA uh, compliance and then health and safety, human access, and the operation manual, and traveling shooting. So we like to have uh, this one just before OG Water 24, early May, so that the uh, Southeast Water Driver <coughs> University, UTS Origin Water, we can demonstrate during the, their uh, exhibition booth. And then people can have uh, this kind of uh, opportunity to try their satellite economy system. Hopefully, yeah, we just briefly, Niga will share the what we can, we plan for the OG water workshop. So can you share a little bit of? Uh, yes, Oz Water uh, 24 
uh, will be in Melbourne. Uh, will be in Melbourne next year in May. And also, water is obviously one uh, is the most important event for all water industry. So hopefully, we can have uh, uh, some kind of uh, launch for our for our nice new futuristic uh, toilets there. But uh, uh, if possible, but uh, meanwhile we hope we can organize some uh, a collective workshop there and invite uh, uh, other researchers, government body, and uh, other uh, involved parties to join us to discuss the future about scale up for the urine uh, collection and uh, resource resource recovery from urine. So yeah, hopefully you can join us and. Uh, just uh, keep your eyes in this uh, in this field. So thank you for the our industry partners, University of Melbourne. So please, uh, if you have any interest and uh, have any idea, because this is the uh, next generation of toilet we want to design. So if you have any idea, okay, we want to put some of the uh, very fancy IoT related technology or some AI machine learning related this small. Uh, caravan for the circular economy system. So very welcome to collaborate together. So still we are in the designing and still we are trying to make sure everything is not perfect yet. So that uh, if you can bring the, your idea, it will be very appreciated. We can have uh, some contribution of the next generation of the toilets. Thank you. Thank you, Sean and Lee, for a, a concise presentation, but also an informative one. So I'd just like to uh, invite now the next group of speakers up, which is St Stefano from University of Melbourne, Matthew from Urban Utilities, and Adam from AJJA. Adam is not here, so we have okay. Vera Costway instead from University of Melbourne. Welcome. Welcome. So I'll just invite them up, and they will be talking about upscaling and field demonstration of new gold technology. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. Thanks. So we're here to represent the uh, Brisbane Node. Uh, although Vera and I work for the University of Melbourne, we have a very long standing collaboration with Urban Utilities due to our past from the University of Queensland. And Matthew here has been championing uh, this project, and not only this project, before NICE, uh, he was the industry. <coughs> representative for our urine separation project that led to NICE. So, so this is the, the Brisbane node. Brisbane node revolves around one pilot unit which will be uh, installed at the park in the middle of Brisbane. So high visibility location, we have a lot of uh, uh, exciting ideas about what to do with it. So. What does it come from? I said we have a previous long-standing collaboration. It started in 2015 between myself and Urban Utilities. Matthew was already on that initial linkage project where we, made, we put together a dedicated toilet block at luggage point in Brisbane. We had some very small reactors to concentrate urine and, uh, and recover selectively the nutrients from it based on 
some water list urinals which are exactly the same as the ones uh, you could see in the toilets here. So we had some um, visibility in the media already and all that was before NICE. Then NICE came along and we decided that we need to do more. We just, it's just not enough to demonstrate that the technology works to actually lead to a circular economy. So we have to do the whole loop, going from urine collection to urine processing, fertilizer, optimization, and, and use. And so that's what we did. Uh, so we're gonna talk about the technology first and then move into uh, the stakeholder value chain. So in terms of technology, Vera will talk about the progress. Sure. So I thought I'd just quickly walk you through the operational principle of the Yugo reactor if you're not familiar with it. Um, so it's something called bioelectro concentration or also microbially assisted electrodialysis. So essentially we're working with a three chamber system that is an electrochemical cell where the anode is, um, or we cultivate microbes at the anode that then catalyze the oxidation reactor, uh, reactions taking place there and end up up concentrating all the key nutrients into this middle chamber with the help of ion exchange membranes. And um, at the pilot, we will be operating uh, 10 of these three chamber reactors in parallel. So they will be uh, stacked up together so that um, each, um, each um, Electrode will be used by two um, cells on each side, um, but each of them will be electronically operated individually. Hydraulically, they'll be con um, uh, combined, which I'll show you on the next slide, actually. <coughs> and the total volume of, of this uh, pilot stack will be one cubic meter. So here's just the piping and instrumentation, which is fairly small and looks complicated, um, but what I want you to just focus on is, this is the three um, chamber set up here in the middle. So we're collecting the urine from the toilets, which I'll also be showing you in a bit. Um, that will be going to a urine tank where urine hydrolysis will take place. It will be pumped into the anode chamber of the system. And then all the anodes of these 10 uh, parallel Reactors will be having a joint anode circulation tank, so all the anodic loops will be mixed together. The overflow will continue to the cathode, and similarly, the cathode will have a joint uh, circulation loop for all the reactors. And here, we're also venting out any hydrogen gas produced uh, at the cathode. And then, essentially, the effluent will just go into the sewer um, for further treatment. And how the site looks. So this is the exact uh, public toilet block we'll be re, uh, or retrofitting with um, <coughs> urine diverting toilets. So we'll be putting in one waterless urinal in the male toilets and then five Wasman EcoFlush urine diverting toilets um, with a minimal water flush. So they're not completely waterless, but the flush water is still very low. And this is what the pilot will then look like there. So this is the toilet block. And then we'll be putting the pilot in a container behind it. And it will be, um, on the outside, it will look similar to the toilet block to blend in nicely. And on the inside, it will look something like this. This was about a month ago when we visited HHAA to see the progress on the pilot. So these are the actual building blocks from which the um, U-Gold system will be put together. It will be placed here on this stand. This is the urine tank, some pumps, and then we'll have a, an extensive remote controlling, um, monitoring and controlling system. So that we'll also be able to keep an eye on the process um, from Melbourne. I think that's all for me. Thanks, Vera. <clears throat> I'll pick up from here. Um, so obviously this looks very big, uh, but this is still a research tool. What we aim to do is, at the end of NICE, just package this into a modular solution which you can 
hold pretty much uh, with your arms. And that's what we, uh, we'll aim to commercialize. Um, so four areas of objectives, or I should call these objectives and collaboration, because there's a lot of uh, collaboration that will be needed. So first up front is technical. We've already sort of demonstrated the technology very small scale back in 2018, but here we need to do it uh, in a more real environment. It was real urine back then, but uh, from a very small pool. Now we're gonna go much bigger. So there's gonna be a lot more variability. So we need to demonstrate the robustness, the durability, and also ability to endure shock loads and chemicals that might accidentally come into the toilet. Uh, we want to demonstrate the chemical and biological safety. So part of this will be with Anne. We'll be looking at taking samples from our system and, uh, and, and looking at the biology. The chemistry we'll be doing at the University of Melbourne and we'll be doing what happens to a broad range of organic chemicals in the urine. Second, moving down, is commercialization. It's one of the key uh, outcomes that uh, we hope to achieve uh, from the node. So Sayed will use this as a case study, so help us with the business model. And we'll assess whether the startup or IP is the right way to go. Uh, probably it's gonna be a company. Commercializing technology or the product. So that's the other thing, maybe there's a lot of different technologies that can make the same things. So does it make sense to protect it? Uh, maybe we just focus on the uniqueness of the product. Um, and then from the point of view of our uh, technology developer partner, AJJA, uh, we say that if we can get 10 orders by the end of NICE, this would be an amazing outcome, which means that uh, we've, we've modularized it and we can sell it and this can be implemented in uh, locations that have similar urine collection systems in place. When it comes to the fertilizer, it's going to be in liquid form, like all the fertilizers we're developing through uh, this hub. Um, determining suitable target crops, uh, so looking at uh, different trials, which will be done mostly by Bernadette's group at USQ. She's not here yet, but she will arrive this afternoon and she will give a talk on this point. Uh, effects on soils and hydroponics, uh, and um, and that's uh, the other collaborative piece. And finally, engagement and communication. Uh, we will never be able to mainstream this if we're not able to get the public on board and the end users on board. So there's a working group already set up for the Brisbane Node, meeting regularly every few weeks to design outreach uh, education communication material, which will also be shared with the broader NICE hub. And uh, social research will take form of QR codes and surveys on site. So this, um, uh, with Cara and uh, Griffith, actually, uh, so all of these projects are involving quite a few partners in the hub, University of Melbourne, Urban Utilities, AJJA, City Park Lands, Brisbane City Council, Griffith University, uh, and the University of Southern Queensland. So, to finish off, Matthew will uh, spend a couple of minutes on uh, what the value chain looks like. Uh, thanks, Stefano, and it's great to be here with everyone. It's my first um, NICE Hub um, Summit, um, so keen to share. So, what we're trying to achieve in the NICE Hub is we're seeking to answer these, some of these key questions that we need to answer to improve long-term sustainability and resilience of both our food and nutrient systems and the water systems that we fundamentally depend on for life. And as one of the wastewater utilities, I'm going to provide a little bit of perspective about how we can, how we need to think about connecting around this shared value that we will have to enable this transformation. So we've heard a little bit about today about um, the need to um, make some changes in our water systems. Um, and we see diverting urine as uh, having high leverage through the urban water system due to its high concentration of nutrients. We can lower the water comp uh, consumption as we avoid flushing and transition to UDT. We can reduce the energy consumption and greenhouse gas emissions and costs for wastewater treatment um, with flow and effects down to nutrient loads in our waterways. But another aspect of this from the wastewater utilities perspective is that we can reduce that scale of our 
future STP treatment upgrades with relatively minor interventions on urine source separation in our urban catchments. Challenges, how can, does this translate into affordability for our customers? With urban densification, we think the opportunities for dense, uh, decentralized treatment will increase. So we think there's good engineering evidence um, coming out of the, uh, our research institutions and partners for the potential value to wastewater utilities and our cities. And as wastewater utilities, we provide essential services, but also we're well connected with local governments and state governments and the development sector. And we're beginning to, uh, we all like to use the phrase, have a seat at the table in terms of shaping the future of our cities. So the question for us is what does this opportunity mean for the way that we evolve our systems and particularly their long-term financial sustainability? Some of those challenges that we have around um, the age and capacity of our assets they mentioned. But crucially, what is our role? What's our role in enabling and influencing this transformation given the connections that we have? But many of the elements like the value chain um, in terms of uh, uh, the nutrient cycles sit outside our traditional circle of influence. I think it's one of the um, key things that I'm keen for uh, this project to help us understand. So when we look at the nutrient system, we have these multiple global factors that are influencing nutrient security, nutrient sources that are non-renewable and uh, potential markets around that, particularly in Australia. Urine has huge potential to meet um, some of this demand and, and green some of this demand, if you like. In the built environment, scaling up the technologies and markets will require a shift in the mindset about what's the role of buildings uh, in our cities as we transform them into green production hubs. Where are the opportunities that we can foster new industries and implement strategies to enhance livability um, locally? It's gonna require shaping and influencing policies, plumbing standards, regulations, um, health and uh, understanding of health risks and uh, performance of fertilizer all the way through. So in the Brisbane hub, we kind of see a lot of these threads coming together in our trial at Victoria Park, Barambin. It's a former golf course in Brisbane's inner city that's being transformed over the next few years with a vision for a, a world-class park. The park already recycled a lot of organics on site and the vision for the master plan is uh, around among other things, saving water, partnering for water transformation, um, showcasing the future of water systems. And looking to the 2032 Olympics, Brisbane is on the world stage. Um, and, you know, you probably hear a lot of the marketing around the event being the Green Olympics, and you know, we're gonna have a lot of visitors coming from overseas and visiting the city and Victoria Park. By then we'll be significantly more developed and, and grown. And so it's within this context that uh, both urban utilities and the council and uh, park planners and operators are seeing the project as a shared value opportunity to activate the site, uh, a project and a place to partner on research and understand the operation and user experience of the toilets, the value of the product, um, so we can be better informed about our strategic direction and the practical considerations of implementing in a real world setting. So this is the for the Brisbane Hub, the key site where we're engaging with the public to communicate the purpose, benefits and activities of the NICE Hub through on-site learning, sharing um, stories from um, City Parkland and, and, and City Council and urban utilities and the role, crucial role that nutrients and water play um, in, in our modern life and why this transformation is, is important. So alongside the Horticulture trials, we aim to provide hopefully some of the excess product um, for use at Victoria Park itself. Um, and in a way it becomes a bit of a symbol and a legacy um, that starts at the park and hopefully it's a you know planting of a small seed that extends and grows out into the future. So I think from, from our perspective, we're really excited about um, the knowledge that we're developing, but Importantly, how do we apply it? How do we connect it up to the connect up all of these different threads of technology, the economics? Uh, what does that mean for strategy and policy going forward? So, yeah, looking forward to working with you all as we advance this knowledge. Thank you.
thank you for that presentation. And I'll just move, just move quickly on to the next group. We're a little bit behind, so I'd just like to invite Jade and Jing, um, Jade from UTS and Jing from Origin Water International. <coughs> they will be doing a presentation on nutrient recovery using membrane technology. So if, if during lunch, if people haven't uploaded their presentations, if they could bring it up during lunch. So good afternoon, everyone. So I'm Jade Jiang. I'm from UTS Research Group. And she's Dr. Ji. She's from Origin Water International. International. So today we're going to present the presentation um, titled Nutrient Recovery Using Membrane Technology. Right, so I'm gonna start with introdu introductions of the collaborative projects between UTS research team and the Origin Water International uh, for the nutrient recovery using membrane technology. Then I'll hand you guys over uh, Dr. Jing and talk about the origin, uh, introduce the Origin uh, Water International. Right, so our first collaborative uh, project titled Fertilizer Recovery from Soft Separated Urine, well Membrane Barrector and Heat Localized Solar Evaporation. Um, the main research findings include, the, first of all, the soft separated urine can be recovered as a solid fertilizer via uh, this hybrid system. The uh, heat localized solar evaporation can achieve a higher like uh, vapor flux and solar to vapor uh, conversion efficiency. Uh, the system process has a zero energy consumption, small footprint, and low, uh, low cost advantages. And the generated solid fertilizer has an excellent performance in basal growth. So you guys can see these figures. Uh, we did the hydroponic test between uh, for the growth of the basal using both um, Urine, so urine based fertilizer and a commercially available fertilizer, and you can see the growth of the basal uh, with our fertilizer do performance like do looks uh, better. Then, the second uh, collaborative project uh, titled Potential Nutrient Recovery from Salt Separate Urine through Hybrid Membrane Barrector and Membrane Capacitive Deionization. So, this in this study, we investigate the, new, the complete nutrient recovery and um, re removal and re uh, recovery from the actual urine. Use the hybrid M MCDI, uh, MBR, uh, uh, MCDI um, system. So the key findings of this research uh, can, can be concluded as um, the hybrid MBR MCDI system can effectively uh, removal and uh, recovery nutrient from human urine as a sustainable fertilizer. The energy efficient, uh, it's an energy efficient process for removal and the recovery of ammonia and uh, nitrate. Then uh, with a low voltage it resulted in lower removal and recovery efficiency in that uh, efficiency of the ions in that uh, hybrid system and a significant improvement and in, uh, in performance at high voltage absorption and high reverse uh, voltage desorption. The third collaborations between uh, our UTS research team and Origin Water International uh, titled Feasibility Study of Powder Activity Carbon Membrane Barrier for Soft Separated Urine Treatment, a uh, comparison with um, MBR. So in this study, we introduced, we introduced the, the product active, activity carbon addition to the uh, like uh, previous uh, MBR reactors to investigate the performance of the nitrification uh, efficiency, the bell mass growth, the, uh, and also the, the removal efficiency of six targeted microfluents. So the conclusions of this study uh, was uh, were like uh, with the high, uh, with the PSA additions in the uh, uh, in our previous uh, MBR, 
we can improve the organic removal efficiency from 88% to 96%. Uh, we promoted the rapid uh, biomass growth, and we increase the flock size by 17%, and um, we can achieve the more than 99% of the removal efficiency of the, among all the targeted um, micropotent. And also, we reduce the membrane falling capacities. The latest uh, collaborative project between UTS research team and Origin Water International uh, was titled a Mi uh, Microbial Community Analyze of a Membrane Barrier Incorporated with bio uh, Biofilm Carriers and Activated Carbon for the Nitrification of Urine. So, the main conclusions from this research project uh, were first of all, the PAC and Biofilm Carriers. Uh, incorporated MBR shows a higher uh, nitrification and a lower uh, hy uh, hydraulic retention time. The microbial diversity and richness reduced by PAC and biofilm carrier addition. And last but not least, is the separated urine feeding significantly shifted um, the microbial community dynamics. All right, so I'll hand over the uh, hand you guys over to Dr. Jing. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, Orange Water uh, actually uh, mainly working on uh, memory technology, applied memory technology to uh, water, uh, wastewater treatment and reuse. So we have done um, many uh, collaboration projects with UTS, as Professor Shaw, uh, from microfiltration memory to uh, RO memory. So for this project, we uh, we, we can develop the unit for uh, MBR and also for the uh, ultrafiltration for our own pre treatment or just uh, for a memory technology uh, application. So, um, for this project, we were just uh, working on MBR. So, uh, basically, basically, this one is a small one, as I mentioned before, it's a really baby one. So, uh, the, tank, the tank is actually very small. The whole system is about like uh, uh, it's also small, like the dimensions. Like, we'll see about like 170 uh, high, uh, that's uh, small. And the uh, um, capacity is also small for, uh, for our system. But during that process, we can modify and also we can see how uh, this system can work well with a uh, nutrient recovery. So um, we will. Uh, find the benefits from this project to our uh, technology and I'm sure also uh, benefit to the community in the future. That's the design. So from that design, we can see really complicated system. But in uh, MBR system, that's the uh, uh, everything we need to concern for the like uh, water level control and also for the like all meters control to connect to the control system. <laughs> That's the real system we uh, actually shown so before. And the inside system actually is complicated. It's really like the uh, treatment plan. That's why we just uh, like keep everything to the small scale. So uh, I hope everything is working well and then I hope uh, we can work together for the future uh, project. Thank you. Yeah, so, yeah, so I'll keep it up from here. And um, here's our future uh, collaboration plans. So we are targeted, uh, our PPI is like uh, we want to achieve uh, publish like three journal articles together and um, attend, like present our collaborative uh, work uh, in four international conferences, four seminars and four scientific talks and also uh, like managed to release like three uh, tweets or posts through the social media in our uh, ARC Night Talk platform. Right. Thank you so much. to introduce our last speaker, Shireb from UTS, um, <coughs> Kiyang Shuk, 
I, I understand is not here today, but um, is the other partner to this project from Ciotech. So I'd just like to hand over to Shrev just right now and from your presentation. Thank you, Jason. Uh, good morning, I still. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm just trying to address some of the issues that we discussed in the morning about the sodium uh, problem. I think this may be one of the solutions. I wouldn't say that this is the best solution. Uh, so I just want to acknowledge first my, uh, the other contributors, uh, Professor Hong Kong Shun. How you lose on peace, uh, master students who worked on this one. Uh, Dr. Pema Durji is not with us, but uh, yeah, he's uh, collaborated us, uh, with us. J, uh, what's it, Jade, and also Kim Suk Kang from Siontech, who is our industry partner, uh, Associate Professor Leonard Tejing, and, and Sean, of course. So this is my line, I'll just skip this one. Uh, as with the, you know, if you look at the urine composition, so it around 25, 2.5% is the urea, and also other inorganic salts around 2%, roughly. So of course the concentration varies, and also a little bit of organics is there. But uh, what we are interested in is the, the, the sodium that is between 1,000 to 4,500 milligram per liter, and the sodium itself, uh, we try to relate to the calcium and magnesium, as I will see later on. So that's why the calcium between 100 and 300 milligram per liter and magnesium 25 to 120 uh, uh, milligram per liter. So the issue with sodium and chloride is the toxicity. So iron toxicity, if you have a lot of sodium, then uh, there are three things that impacts uh, the iron toxicity, then osmotic stress that it uh, induces to the the plants, and also it, uh, yeah, of course, that uh, results in the reduction in the yield. The other problem is the the soil degradation. So it displaces uh, uh, magnesium and calcium in the soil, and what it happens is that it uh, the, it degrades the soil quality, and then it uh, uh, results in aggregation of soil, reduce soil permeability and poor aeration. So these are some of the problems. As you can see from this picture, that you know, if the, the sodium bond you can see in the leaves, so this is because of the excess of sodium in the in the uh, in the soil. So another this one way of um, measuring the water quality, for example, is they, when you irrigate, is uh, they use this uh, called sodium absorption ratio, which is a relative uh, uh, concentration of sodium, as you can see from the equation there. And so if, if the relative concentration of the sodium with respect to calcium and magnesium is in a higher side and in relative to the, you know, the total, um, the conductivity, electrical conductivity of the, the irrigation water, if you're talking about, then there's a certain threshold that if it is within that line, uh, for example, uh, so if it's within that, uh, if it is below this one, it's okay, that it uh, doesn't really impact the soil, but if it is within that, it have a moderate, and anything about that, it is quite uh, significantly uh, damaged the soil. So, so in our case, for example, we saw that the, just roughly our the sodium absorption ratio is between 20 and 56 for the fresh urine. And if you dial it farther, it goes to something like, uh, uh, if you say, for example, usually urine could be diluted up to five to 10 times before you apply. And then you, if you do that, then the sodium absorption ratio could reduce to 10 to 18. But uh, yeah, still in the long term, probably it's a problem. Uh, uh, earlier, Ami was saying that it may not be a problem in, the, the, in certain parts, like uh, in the United States where there's a lot of rain, it can flush. But uh, in Australia, where the water is a problem, an issue, so you may not have that luxury of the rain flushing your, uh, the, the sodium uh, deposits in the soil. So you may have still have a challenge. So the other issue that we're looking at is that, you know, not only to the plants, but also it may also have some issue with the, the, the quality of the urine fertilizer itself. And then people may say, oh, that your sodium concentration is high if people uh, who are aware of the sodium problem. And also that when we are concentrating the uh, fertilizer, 
they really didn't fertilize it. It again magnifies the sodium concentration. That becomes even more alarming. So that's why we try to see how we can re uh, remove the sodium. So removing sodium is <laughs> is a challenge because you know it's uh, because there are many other ions present together. So we are looking at how we can use membrane capacitive deionization. That uh, is electrochemical process. Uh, it's electrochemical process where we use anode and cathode. And there's an exchange membrane that allows only certain ions to pass through. And then we are trying to see if we can do this, uh, apply this one. So that the objective here is to evaluate the cap uh, capacity uh, deionization, so membrane capacity, MCDI, to separate the urea and the ions. Ions can be separated based on this technology. So if you separate ions, at least we have sodium on one side, and then, then we can further process them and re return it back. So. So this is the, the concept that we developed here. For example, if you have a urine here, if you have urine here, and then you, but it has to be fresh urine, so you can't use with the, the hydrolyzed urine because you have a lot, uh, the urea is already converted. So here, we use MCDI to separate urea and urine. Uh, what's the urea and the ions? Ion goes to the nanofiltration, and because ions, there are a lot of, Besides sodium, we have calcium, magnesium, potassium, which is useful for that. We want to return uh, using nanofiltration, return it back, and then uh, join together. So urea that can go to the, uh, the MBR process that we're talking about, and then uh, the process it to convert into a nitrification. So now you have nitrified urine coming up, and then of course we can concentrate later using MDO. So that's what we have here. Sodium will be gone through the here, so probably something like we are expecting uh, more than 50% of sodium could bleed out from the system. But uh, we also lose, uh, lose some uh, the other essential ions like uh, potassium, so that's one of the challenges. So this is the, the CDI stake uh, that, uh, we, uh, that we use in the lab. So this is the process, I, think I don't want to discuss, maybe I think many of you know this. How, we have a cathode and anode, and then cathode is pos uh, positive, uh, anode is positively charged, and then yeah, so the ions get attracted on each other, and then so they are in that way, separate. So these are some of the operating parameters that we used. Uh, this in, of course, we did with the synthetic uh, urine. So the, the results I just want to present here. So we just, just initially did the uh, validation experiment. Just uh, we have urea and just the sodium and chloride, no other ions. And you can see that, of course, this is a batch process, so we have to do it again and again and again. So you will see that the concentration of the uh, the what's it, the ions is going down, whereas the urea is remaining almost constant. So, so, so that means actually this is just proving that you, know, you can separate the urea and the the ions, uh, sodium and chloride ions. So, other thing is that now we want to see how the voltage. Uh, the, the, because you apply you usually apply at a constant voltage and then varying current. Uh, usually we try to operate at lower voltage, less than one volt, because you don't want to have this electrolysis happening. But as we try to look at different uh, high voltage and we try to operate at the atmosphere operated at two volt, we see that the one of the interesting things you observe was the pH was suddenly dropping at a certain point. pH was dropping, so so we think that this could be. <laughs> Could be one way of uh, a good thing for us because, it, as uh, Abram was saying, that we store urine uh, under high pH. Uh, you put acid and all, so probably you don't have to put acid here because you can generate acid uh, through this uh, water hydrolysis. Well, here, if you could say there's some water oxidation going on the anode side, anode side so that uh, this produces H plus ion, so that increases the pH, uh, decreases the pH of the, the urine. So in that way, you have a uh, urea separated and, and a high pH probably can store the urine for uh, urea for a longer time and probably it will have somehow uh, Besant's uh, problem of in storing the and transporting the urea. So we tried that different like influence of flow rates and I didn't see many impact on that. There was not so much influence on the influence of flow rate. Uh, we did also absorption time. Yeah, absorption time of course it's a uh, the, the more the absorption time, the, the longer period it has to absorb the ion. So, of course, the, if you have less time, it, uh, if you have less absorption time, uh, it takes longer time and then you have more cycles to do it. So, it's uh, this is what But basically, but look at the, 
the urea concentration, but it remains constant. That's one of the advantages we have because it's not really absorbing on the on the CDR electrodes. So we also tried this one with the influence of salinity that we have. So of course this is not really impacting that because they, we have to have a higher uh, uh, you know number of cycles based process to concentrate all the urine uh, ions. But urea is almost like similar constant. So this also we also tried with different urea concentration and also the impacts are almost the same. So there's not much impact, so I just want to skip. So the summary is that, you know, the membrane capacitive deionization can be effective process for reducing the salinity in the urine. Of course, we will have to, uh, let's say, come up with nanofiltration to bleed out, because if either you only have a urea uh, solution that can be used, but the plants require other elements also, so you don't want to be thrown away. So nanofiltration is one. Of course, we are not, I'm not presenting the nanofiltration by Excel. We will be doing that one as part of the future study. And also we want to see, because it's additional cost coming in here, when you put nanofiltration, we want to see uh, how does the economics say about that. Okay, that's it all. Thank you very much. I think I just want to acknowledge my, our industry partner, Tech and ARC for supporting this. Thank you. Five minutes for questions before we let everyone go for lunch <laughs> and a bit of a break. Um, and there's obviously more question time then. So if I could ask all the presenters maybe to come up front, you can bring a chair if you like. Um, <laughs> it is 25 minutes. Um, and then just let everyone get up the front first. So, are there questions? Are there any questions? Yes. Thank you. Um, I have a question about that last presentation. That was very interesting. Thank you. Um, I was trying to understand the uh, the level of salt that you said was of concern. Um, is it possible to go back to that to that slide? Um, was I reading it correctly that the um, that the conductivities? This one. Uh, that one there, here. yes, okay. The, the conductivity of 1.5 to 20 uh, millisiemens per centimeter, that was the diluted urine? And, yeah, yes, okay. that's the good that. And that chart there is for irrigation water, so if we look at 1.5 or 2, then that, that could cause damage. But my question was, um, isn't there a lot more irrigation water, a lot more liters of irrigation water being put down per acre than than liters of urine, and, and what would the consequence of that be? You know, maybe doing, you know, urine is a small amount of fertilizer, but then a lot of and irrigation water, would that overwhelm the effect of the urine? Uh, I didn't look at that from that angle. I think you're right. Uh, if, if, if you're doing a mix of irrigation, or what we're talking about here, only if you're doing uh, as, uh, Feel that only irrigates using the the urine uh, for, uh, fertilizer, and I mean, uh, all we try to say is like you mix the urine and then irrigate right together with the irrigation water. But yeah, to, uh, like I said, there's already sodium in the irrigation water itself, so that may also contribute. But yeah, I we didn't really look at the detail of that one, but I we're just looking at see how, uh, especially when we concentrate the urine, it is really um, the the number, sodium number is really showing up, and it may be a little bit of uh, you know uh, fear for the people who are using, especially people, the farmers who are a bit uh, reluctant to be uh, using the sodium high sodium concentration. Of course, if you dilute it, it goes down the really dilute, uh, to the extent of how much you are diluting. But but still, we feel that it may have some negative impact on. I'm not so much on the plant, but for the people who are buying the, the product for the use. So they don't want to be, say for example, if the farmers, they want to sell this, I uh, would say, grow this uh, food uh, product using this, uh, the urine and then a lot of sodium or something like that. And then maybe, I mean, this is just from the perspective, uh, the user's perspective, but yeah. I'm sorry because I haven't really proved this. This is, yeah. Thank you. 
So you're saying it's uh, possible just for social uh, acceptance yeah. uh, perspective. It would be really good to actually quantify uh, what's the impact of that additional yeah. sodium uh, on top of the baseline uh, irrigation water. Yeah. I think that's, uh, yeah. But if you, because if you concentrate the, the urine fertilizer and then you're adding sodium in the irrigation water, it also contains sodium, it's again you're adding more masses. Right, so that could be an additional problem, isn't it? If the sodium is already present in the irrigation water, yeah, because the mass is increased here, right? Yeah, so it's that just whether is that twenty percent or one hundred percent or one percent? I think that's uh, what Abraham yeah. was asking. Yeah. I think that it really needs to be done. Yes, yes, I yeah. think so. Can I ask a related question? Sure. I'm just wondering if any of the work that Bernadette's doing up in Toowoomba is going to look at that in the soils and whether there's any accumulation over time with that as well. Um, look, um, this is what the summit's all about, is understanding all of the potential contaminants. And so, you know, I'd love to continue talking. We have yet to really understand you know, how we're looking at it contaminant wise and so salt obviously you know the sodium part is a big one so yeah definitely we're keeping that one open when we get material to to work with further questions yes and probably more comments than anything that's anything's well thank you Zusha, got time. thanks everyone for a really good it's so i'm learning so much I just like to know that we are going to get copies of these slides so that we can study these things because we can't take notes on all the, yeah. the very you just presented such a simple easy to understand schematic um, for the process and people like me need that i need sort of the um i'll just get you to audio record and even another um, dummies <laughs> guideline to understanding <laughs> these um, engineering processes but um michael i was going to ask about the all the different options that you sort of want to highlight around urban utilities, all the opportunities. Um, I'm also really keen to sort of think about blue sky, what are the different possibilities are, so that I can include those sort of possibilities in the modelling too. You know, so it just emphasises in the Brisbane hub that the more we have these platforms to share our ideas and aspirations, we don't think, oh, two years time, oh gee, I wish I'd looked at that. <laughs> so um, no, thank you everybody, it was really good. Expand on the broad interests a bit, or yeah, what type of things do you want to water with it? What's blue sky? What? Yeah, I mean that's that's a fairly broad question. Um, <laughs> look, internally, we're having you know a lot of the discussion is focused on like what is our role. We can conceive of a number of different say business models about how you might you know, stand up a different parts of the value chain, um, some of which are already sort of in place. Um, other parts uh, will need a lot more work than others. Um, and so we're thinking about it from the perspective of, um, from the utilities role, um, what level of investment, you know, I guess, what are the different options and what does that mean for how we invest? So we might simply be a supporter and we might say yes we endorse in principle you're in separation and diversion go for your life and do that in an un unrestricted way another way might be well we're investing in nutrient uh, uh, nutrient treatment at our treatment plants um, if you're in diversion and nutrient um, you know, if there was a if there was a business that set itself up and was able to move really quickly, that might that potentially might undermine the efficiency of or the prudency and efficiency of that investment. So that might speak to maybe more of a regulatory role, or a, um, um, and we say do it in these areas, do it in these areas. Another way of looking at it is if we know that there are good benefits, um, and and I think there's really strong evidence, um, even in the limited amount of research that is. I mean, even just logically, we can see that there might be really good benefits for us. We might even want to incentivize um, that, um, and you know, um, incentivizations can take a number of different forms. 
um, you know, paying for performance, you know, paying um, you know, infrastructure offsets and all that sort of thing. Um, the challenge there is um, you need to permanently sort of load shift that urine off the system and we need to, we need to have some sort of confidence around that um, in order to sort of bank the savings and actually just apply deferral and um, upgrades. All this is, all the, a lot of this is in my, in my head and some other limited discussions around the business. Um, and use, just using my imagination to think about possible scenarios. So none of this is, is policy or anything like that, or um, you know, drawing a line in the sand, we're gonna do it this way. Um, so on the other hand, you might think of, um, so maybe a more novel approach is, you know, think of the portaloo sector as we sort of saw there. Um, they've sort of got a value chain already set up. It might only be a small switch to, you know, stop using chemicals in your toilets. And you know, instead of paying um, sort of uh, trade waste charges to the utility, maybe they could make a saleable product instead. For example, so you know, I, th I think that's I think that business model, um, all all that discussion to me is really interesting. Um, you can conceive you know conceive a number of different ways of doing that. You know, is it something that you know you see some utilities spinning off little um, entities to go and work on, um, you know, these sort of initiatives. Um, is it a technology company? So there's techno technological opportunities there around advanced manufacturing, as I mentioned. <coughs> there's a, a servicing component of taking nutrients away from buildings, and then there's a value adding component as well. So there's, you know, all of these sort of questions are basically up for grabs. We've got a it's basically a, a, a blank slate, but if you if, if you look closely, I think you can sort of see how these you know, some of these things. You know, if there was an entrepreneurial portly company, maybe that's something they could do. Um, but yeah, um, definitely the economics and understanding how those um, um, per um, say it's a um, diagram. Basically, we've got two streams. We've got a conventional uh, linear system, and we, we understand that system really, really, really well. Um, the economics and the cost-benefit analysis will be, I, I think, a key part of helping to understand what our role is. Are we supporting it? Is it something that we want to invest in? Are we just being a regulator? Are we incentivizing it? All those questions are really up for grabs. So um, all the work that's happening here um, really helps to inform us um, and, and what our next moves might be. As I mentioned in my presentation, we have a, um, a seat at the table in terms of influence and shaping um, um, other sort of authorizing institutions mm -hmm. um, in the local area. Um, we're well connected with the likes of DES and uh, we have the relationships with um, Queensland Health and, and others, and now we have connections with the EPW through this work. So we're sort of, as we're going through this project, we're also um, you know, testing and learning these things together and building those relationships that we're gonna to need to on the track. So yeah. does that, does that we help? We can have a big ideas war where we sort of put up all sorts of blue sky <laughs> thinking and then if one of us says, ah, that's never gonna fly. Yeah. And so, but, you know, we can make a, a shared safe space to give each other feedback and ideas and It'd be nice to just have to come up with the platform to do that, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that further explanation. Are there any other questions? Yes. Um, thank you. I'm really interested in the nice moon concept and uh, what Sean and Lee presented. I saw in your presentation you mentioned you're going to test some optimized aeration to control the mem membrane fouling mm -hmm. and just also like. Stefano was talking about ROFA, the fouling control. I wonder, like, are you going to look at that? Because previously at UQ we did some free nitrous acid testing as a biocidal agent to um, help with coping with the fouling. I guess likely free ammonia would do the same. Maybe that's something, I'm not sure whether you'll be looking at that, but I think that's probably something that would be interesting in addition to aeration control. I can. Pick, having 
done a bit of research on the antifouling properties of ammonia, that the concentration of free ammonia you need is well above the one you have in urine. So you need to concentrate it. That's why it works for RO, because in the concentrate side of the membrane, you reach those critical concentrations. But in the MBR, uh, you're still working on the uh, concentrations that you have in the urine. It's not quite <coughs> enough. Can you add base? <coughs> it's just not it. Even, even if 100% was in the free ammonia form, it wouldn't be enough. That's very high in this case. Yeah, you need to go up uh, around the chant, what, like six, seven grams per liter? Um, the critical concentration that can inhibit the bacterial growth is around five, four to five grams per liter ammonia. Of free ammonia. Of free ammonia, oh. yeah. Oh, that's super high. Okay. Sean, did you want to respond? Uh, regarding our MBR, so <coughs> in fact, our HRT is uh, very high. So we have more problem of the AOB, NOB reaction rather than membrane fouling oh. because uh, our flux is uh, less than 5 LMH, which means very much uh, lower than our critical flux of the membrane behavior. So that uh, even though we have our parade downstairs in our basement, so for the last three years, we never ever had any membrane fouling issue. So that's the, what we have, uh, one of the advantage of MBI. It's not like a typical wastewater membrane barrier. This is the more about focused on nitrification rather than fouling. So we don't have any membrane fouling issue for the operation. Aeration is uh, because of the AOB, NOB bacteria, not for fouling control. No. So we have no fouling issue at this moment. Oh, thank you. What about the MD? MD, MD is a different issue. MD is more of a wetting problem rather than fouling is, uh, of course, you concentrate more and uh, we have a uh, fouling is there. but. It can recover easily fouling after you just flush the water. However, the membrane distillation is still a wetting issue. So when you have a wetting, so you cannot make a good concentrate in your urine. So commercial opportunity is a little bit yeah, less likely to happen. Just to put the research purpose, yes, you can do. But the commercialization, we don't really consider MD will be the our targeted commercial opportunities. Yeah. And a, a following comment. Um, not long ago, I, I was talking to a friend. Uh, just a comment, I think maybe of people, everybody's interest in, in this research area. Uh, not long ago, I, I was in contact with a friend in China. He sent a photo to me. He, was, he went to a toilet in China, and uh, there's a screen. And um, you can scan the QR code if you pay like uh, uh, 10 yuan or 20 yuan, that's like four or five bucks. And after you pee, it tells some of like your <laughs> health conditions, etc. <laughs> like diabetes, likeliness, etc. I'm not sure if, if that can be incorporated in a nice rule sort of thing. That's like commercialization model. I think you probably can get some revenue out of it. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the ISF is working on it, right? Like the urine, depending on your colority, depending on the, your salinity, also depending on the some protein, so they can detect the, some of the dehydrated condition, which uh, you have a high salinity, you discharge because the, your, uh, your kidney is not working properly, so that you have very high voltage reaching out to your body system. So there are many ways of detecting the maybe cancer, cancer cell protein, they have some sensor. So ISL people, I know that Simon is working on this uh, area of the toilet and then your, the health check the connection. That could be the yeah, idea we can connect. That's the, initially it was on the, our table, but still technology is not available. So we haven't really considered at this moment, but in the future, yes, you are right. So you can see the general like, uh, your health check can be done based on the, your urine. Mm -hmm. It can be an yeah, initial stage we can consider. But we like to give, uh, okay, you have a QR code in our urine screen, then you donate the urine, and then we can give uh, like a voucher. 
So you can keep the 10 urine, you can give her one coffee. Come on, coffee. <laughs> so that's the, our it's a consideration. Rather than like a hashtag of the, get the money from our users. We want to give more rather than take it. It's a bit of a circular economy and that's right. Right. <laughs> yeah. um, yes. So one last yeah. On this, uh, we got ethics ethics approval to actually use uh, the data uh, for uh, further purposes. So in the future, we can you know do epidemiology slash public health slash uh, lifestyle studies based on uh, what we measure in the urine, which all could be of interest. Yes, uh, Stefano, you mentioned in your presentation um, there's a comms piece around the project up in Brisbane. Um, yeah, I just want to understand a little bit better the, what the communication strategy is. It, is it sort of looking at um, changing people's minds, perception of urine being used as a fertilizer, or is it more to do with just the resource capture um, what what is the is there a communication strategy? And what's the what's the process? We haven't really developed it yet. Um, so what I know is that they don't want to let the universities run it. So city council wants to have a a, a big role there, uh, interfacing with the public. So I think they're interested in uh, in how people perceive the use of these toilets primarily because if they're going to implement it in multiple sites, the user experience is, uh, is important. Uh, just pure educational material uh, would be included as well. And then um, the perception of the use of the fertilizer um, by the end user community. But this is on the design phase and uh, it will be co-designed with city council, urban utilities, city park lands, and the universities. Are there, is there a further question? No questions, but I won't um, hold people away from lunch. I don't want to be the chair that does that. <laughs> so. <laughs> Um, you can ask more questions, obviously, of our presenters during lunch, and so we're just got about four extra minutes for lunch now. And I'd just like to give a round of applause for our presenters. <laughs> uh, um, I heard lunch arriving quite a few times, and several of our presenters were fabulous. They they went straight through it and actually didn't stop. So congratulations on that as well. Um, so if everyone wanted to start with lunch, it's in the far corner.